uh, walking with dinosaurs. So, unlike, unfortunately, what was advertised, uh, which was the more the general dinosaur talk, I didn't have the attention of giving the dinosaur general talk. I want to talk more personally about uh, my experience um, in the Paluxy River. So, I'm going to talk about literally walking with dinosaurs, why it's important, and uh, then we can do some questions and answers. Well, I have till what? One, how does that work? 2.15? What is it? 2.15. Whatever. <laughs> Don't say whatever. <laughs> Don't say, oh, can we get a picture? Oh, yeah. Let's get a picture with you and, and me. Well, we'll get him up here and we'll take a picture and then have everybody behind. Hopefully, oh, yeah. so hopefully you smiling. No, you're down here. Okay, I'll be up here. I'll give you a camera so oh, we can... I meant to do that this morning. Yeah, yeah. All right. So pretend you're like double number of people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Probably get you to send those to me. All right, I will. You're not in them, though. No. Okay. <laughs> we could use, we use Photoshop. You missed all this side? Why didn't you get back? Because <laughs> you, you, his wife said, I do, like my wife, I do not want to be in any pictures. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, let's move, uh, move forward. So just a couple... Hold on, is that big enough? Yeah, sort of. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about footsteps. So I figured, why not a couple of verses? There's lots of footsteps in the Bible. So the steps of a man are established by God, and he delights in his way. Psalms 37, 23. Another one, establish my footsteps in your word, and do not let any iniquity have dominion over me. Great prayer. That's great prayer. Um, uh, we have this concept. In fact, I was just talking with your... They're not here. The night, uh, your night, well, you have two of them, but one of your Nigerian couples, uh, the one that his wife is Omatola, because Omatola happens to be the name of my uh, project manager that works for me, who's Nigerian, Omatola, who's Christian. And uh, so we were discussing this, uh, um, and um, uh, she named, uh, the Oma, my Omatola, <laughs> named her son Alana, and Lana means walking in the way of God. That's what her son is, so Lana, so this made me think of that. Uh, so we want to walk in the way of God, and that's basically my testimony. I, 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 uh, I accepted the Lord after a long life of debauchery at three and a half years old. And uh, so uh, the, the rest of it basically is the anti-testimony. I didn't you know, have any angels stop me from falling off cliffs. I didn't have it. It's just a, a question of making decisions um, throughout my life to say, am I going to do what I know the Lord wants me to do or am I going to do my thing? And it was continuing. I don't always make the right decisions. I try to, though. And uh, the Lord has led that in many, with many uh, surprising results, really. Surprising. Sometimes I've gone places I didn't want to go. But the Lord did good stuff. You only find out afterwards. Though. Okay, Job 23.11. My foot has held, held fast to his path. I have kept his way and not turned aside. That's a great verse. And finally, I have, for you have been called for this purpose in 1 Peter 2.21. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. So we want to follow in the steps of the Lord. And we're actually going to look at some steps and following in steps is the reason why I said that, of course, that have to do with dinosaurs. So, it's really easy for you to figure out what this is a footprint of, right? You can tell me? Dog, or actually, probably not dog, but close. Eat cat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> big cat, big cat. Uh, but anyway, the fact is that it, it's an imprint, right, in sand? So that's what footprints are. When I was in Eng England uh, on the beaches of, the, of what they call Dinosaur Island, it's Wright Island, you have these dinosaur footprints that are, that are um, it's like, the, imagine if the, the, the footprint you have here, imagine it was a dinosaur footprint, was filled in, you know, as if it was a cast, okay? It was filled in, and then everything else arose, you just have the center. And so you have these dinosaur footprints like in 3D. And they're like floating, well, they're not floating the rock, but they're, they're like all over the beach because they've dropped out of the cliff. I have some pictures of those. Uh, but normally these are, you know, it's mud, right? Dinosaurs, every, the flood is giving in, bringing in massive amounts of mud. You know, we think it rained, it rained. The rain, since the fountains of the deep break up, it maybe could be 10 kilometers deep. The water is coming up, it's taking, it's, it's absorbing the soil around the Earth's crust as it comes up, and so what's coming down is mud. 
Okay, it's not coming down like clean rain like we have now. It's coming down like massive mud, mud flying over. You got waves that maybe tidal waves that maybe four tsunami waves that are maybe 400 feet high, like 100, 150 meters high. And there, and every, um, uh, every tide is going to bring in a layer. In fact, dinosaur nests are polystrate. They're laying them, and they're not laying them on the beach. They're on mud because they're mud fl flat, you know, flats. If you think of if you had a flood, if we try to put ourselves in the idea of a, a global flood, okay, initially everything's not covered, but, you know, once the ark, and by the way, the ark didn't start floating on day one. I don't know if you knew that. It took a, it took a while, which is really, uh, how should I say this? If you start imagining it, it's like, it's not stressful, it's um, shocking in a way, because God closed the door. Noah's been preaching. He's like, Noah's like the, the history's worst evangelist. He preached for 120 years and no one followed him except his family, which didn't really have a choice. So, but he was the righteous man. He was doing what God told him to do. 120 years. Would you mind preaching? I'd be really like so discouraged. So he gets on the ark. God closes the door. And I can assure you, now the water is starting to come up. That people want to get on the ark. You know? But God, but Noah didn't close the door. This is a very bad situation. It's not like the cartoons we show in our in our little Sunday schools, ah, happy Noah and his wife and one giraffe, one elephant, and a rabbit. No, they're, he's been trying for 120 years to get someone on the boat. Now they want to come, God's closed the door. That's big. And what's really big when you think about it is, and I didn't want to go there, but I'm going there because that's what the Lord is eating me. When you, when you think about it, is that as the seven day, as, as the week is coming on and, and the waters are going up and things are starting to get covered, it's getting worse and it's raining. It's catastrophe, right? It's raining bad things. Co continental, dri uh, continental separation is happening in the Atlantic. Things are happening, big things. Weather patterns are all changed and water's coming up. Uh, and they get up to the, you know, the boat. Boat's not floating yet, still coming up, but people are treading water. And then they're, they're, they're still trying to go on. Absolutely, they're desperate. Noah, open. Open. We believe now. Open. Until about three or four days in, and then you just get... And then it's silence. No one, no one, Mrs. No one, their family, they knew these people. They worked with them. They probably, they were contractors working for them. They, they didn't build the ark just to the eight people. They, um, uh, these were people they lived, they loved, they worked with, they cherished... They're outside, and they drown. I'm sure this was not a happy time for Noah and his wife. Of course, it's representative of the fact that we need to make a choice for the Lord while the door is open. And it's serious stuff. I mean, Noah wouldn't, if he was, Noah was here, he wouldn't be making any joke about it. He said, I lost all my friends. He said, I talked to them for 120 years. I pleaded with them. I tried to tell them the truth. I, tried to, I told them everything the Lord told me. I told them, I built a massive boat. I said, it's coming. You got to come. And they said, they just laughed. And when they wanted to come on, they couldn't because God had closed the door. Big stuff. I mean, heavy stuff. So, back to my cat. Fossils. Uh, okay, so we can see the imprints. Now you see human imprint. Uh, you've got the ball. You've got Because why are we looking at this? Because when we go look at stuff in mud, we want to know how do we identify what we're looking at. Okay? So we have the the human foot, you have the five toes, uh, and you have the ball, and you have the, the, um, the arch, unless you're flat-footed, and then you have the, uh, you know, the, the heel. So we have that. So you have these, these characteristic uh, ways of identifying that it's a print, that it's not just an artifact, and also identifying where it came from. It couldn't be that of an ape, because apes don't have hands. They, have, uh, they don't have feet. They have hands. Okay? So the print wouldn't be the same if it was an ape or chimpanzee or whatever. They don't have four hands. So, now mud also, when you're walking in it, moves, right? We were looking at sand, sand, dry sand's easy, or slightly wet sand. But when you're in mud, things slip around, right? So you, you're not necessarily going to always have a clean footprint because you'll be stepping it and you could slide forward, could slide backward. And you'll, if it's sticky mud, when you lift up, the mud will follow, right? And so you have these... This effect that happens. So we would expect that if you're in a mud plane. So these are, these are f people footprints that you're seeing here. See, notice you can hardly see the ten toes. But this is a human made that footprint, <laughs> okay? So it's not always as clean as we'd like it to be when you're in mud because you're slipping around. But it's still human. 
you can see you can see how the how the mud is like come in a little bit on the edges. Uh, so so let's yeah I'll explain something I'll show you in a moment what happens because I actually did an experiment when I was down in the Pilexi. Uh This here happened. This is a uh, an example of being in mud where you see a footprint in the mud and some more. So with that with a bit of background, let's go to the Pilexi River. So the Pilexi River has been talked about for decades. Uh, it has the longest dinosaur tracks in the world. Uh, when I when I longest continuous left, right, left, right, left, right, dinosaur tracks in the world. In fact, I, I'll show you, I worked on the, what's considered the third longest in the world. Uh, Dr. Ball, this is his second building. He actually has a big extension now on the right-hand side where there's a whole bunch of stuff going on because he has a guy, a Christian who, was in, who has like 28 patents around fiber optics uh, who has come to help him and financially has no issues and so is, uh, has built a whole section added onto this creation museum. He started off with like a log cabin. Uh, but he had the, the rights to this area in the Palaxi River where there were these dinosaur tracks. But there's more than the dinosaur tracks. So let me explain to you a little bit. This is when I was down there. And, uh, and so you see this ledge. So I'm looking over the ledge. You can see those dinosaur tracks right there. There's one there. Now this is without moving any of the mud off it. But you can see dinosaur tracks. That's a dog. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, you, so what happens is the, the, the Palaxi River is a really uh, shallow river comes up and, and covers the area. Well, people are talking around us because there's a bunch of it. So, uh, and there you can see there's a, like a ledge. I call it, it's a hard top. And the hard top, they, the, most of the tracks are on the, underneath the ledge, but there are some tracks on the hard top, but there are less. It's all Cretaceous. It's all supposed to be about 140 million years old. Okay? So, to start off the day, we had, we, had, we, we had a meeting in April with a whole bunch of creation leaders, people who have creation museums in the U.S. Uh, I think, yeah, there was just myself and Jean-Francois who were from Canada, and everybody else was U.S. And so they, they were in Texas. It had rained, and they said, we want to do some experiments to see what the footprints look like in mud, and we have a field out there. Who wants to take off their shoes in its mud? It's, it's got like 15 degrees Celsius. And only the Canadians said yes. <laughs> I said, sure, <laughs> I'll walk in mud. So, so they had me walk up and down. They were filming it, and then they started measuring it. It was sort of funny. Um, but it was a good experiment because we got to see the effect. You, know, you can see these prints aren't nearly as tidy as they would be on a beach. Okay, keep that in clean, but sometimes. So to get it tidy as a beach, I actually had to... I, I couldn't walk and get it tidy. I had to like step and then put pressure without movement, and then it created sort of a mold, and then I could go to the next one. But if I was walking, my, there'd always be a bit of a slip, because you're in mud, right? And if you, the faster you walk, the more there's a slip. And uh, so when they actually measured the size of my prints, they would say, you're, well, you're 11 and a half. But no, I'm actually a 10 and a half, but it's because I was to 11, so, because my foot was moving. And, um, and you see here, I'm... Uh, Okay, so what happens is the river comes up, and the river can come up pretty high. When there's a storm, the Paluxy can raise like, I don't know, 15 meters or something. It's like nuts. It's, it, it's very dangerous. Um, it's, one of the one, it's one of the rivers that raises the highest in uh, North America and because it's very shallow, and there's a big source of water at the top. Um, usually it isn't. Like here it was down, which is good because we saw the snakes on the other side of the river. Uh, and the idea is you have to clean off that overlay that's here. So this is the hard top. And then there's a section down, and then under here where we see all the tracks, there's, there's um, clay, like any river, you know, you just put clay over it. And so you have to get the, rid of the clay, but the thing is, is the, the, the prints are also made in mud, you know, like calcium-type mud. It's all calcium. It's limestone. So it's, very, it's actually rather fragile, especially when you're playing around with water in it and trying to get mud off. So let me explain. So we start with these, like, paintbrush, uh, well, not a paintbrush, a washing brush. We start taking things off carefully. You start moving all the, uh, the clay off that is built up. Uh, this had already been taken off by a, a group that was before us. And then you start, so we were going to take these tracks, start back there, and I'll tell you what they are in a moment. They're webbed, they're like webbed feet with three in the front. Uh, well, maybe four, but I'll, show, I'll explain. And then, uh, then there are several tools you have to use to keep going down until you clean them. Our goal is to make a cast because you want to study them, but you can't study them there. It was like 100 degrees out there, by the way. It was really hot. So there you see the Canadian doing the, <laughs> doing the work and uh, brushing this stuff off because I'm always game. The other guys were like sitting back. Then they joined me. 
Uh, so you need a trowel, a brush, a paintbrush, sun protection, insect protection, <laughs> all good stuff, <laughs> and some security. You have to be careful. You're on the side of the river. You're, you, it's easy to back up and whoop, you're gone, and you're in rock. You know, you could really... And there are snakes. It's Texas. <laughs> the snakes never really showed up. They, we did see them on the other side of the river, so we didn't go to the other side of the river. Um, now... So the goal is to remove the clay without damaging. This is a pterosaur. I'll explain why in a moment. So we were in there with a little, uh, like a toothbrush type thing. Uh, uh, oh, that's the other side of a paintbrush. Just getting out all. Because what we want to do is we want to clean that track and then we want to make a cast. We want to take a copy, bring it in the lab and then make a mold. And then we can study. It's like we make a mirror and then we bring it into the cast and then we make another copy and then we're back to what it originally was. Um, with the mold. That's how we, all, all museums will work. Not everybody uses latex, though. We, we use latex because Joe Taylor, I'll show Joe Taylor, well, you'll see Joe Taylor, the, the man with the beard there, he's Christian. He's one of the top cast makers in the world. Uh, museums use him worldwide. He's like, we did a massive mosasaur that he was doing in the lab, just fantastic. Really nice guy, a hippie out of the 60s, so he's very funny. Uh, <laughs> really, he's very funny. Um, and uh, so you can see the tracks we were cleaning out. We cleaned them out here, and here we were measuring the stride, which was about um, uh, 48 inches, a big stride, okay, and that were going between the tracks, and here you have one that's a little bit deeper than the two that follow, but clearly the same creature, but a little bit deeper, and here there's two, so now you've got two in the middle, like two toes in the middle, two, I can't do this with my fingers, but anyway, two like that, and two like, and they, it seems to be webbed, and it seems to be big, and there's like this, if you see here, see that like, it goes back, so it's like a bird, uh, what we think is a pterosaur, like a big pterosaur. And here you see he's taking out the latex, I think. So he has this latex, which is rubber. And then right on the rock... So I'm, I'm speaking, I can't turn the sound down. Uh, oh, maybe I can. So, yeah, so sometimes they do use silicone, but they're using latex, and he's putting it directly on the rock. Okay, I won't go through all of that. So then... So he puts on the lid. Did I just go to the same one? Yeah, I did the same one. Okay, keep going. Okay, then he ends up like this that we've cleaned out. Uh, took us like a day. <laughs> cleaned out, and then we put the latex over, and then you've got to put something on the latex to solidify it. So we put in some burlap. And uh, I don't know if that's a video. Everything's a little video. Yeah, so then you put in all this burlap, and then you're going to put latex on it again to solidify the, the burlap. And then uh, we're going to cover it up um, so it dries out and keep it protected for the night. Now, you'll see that ledge here. You can see the hard top, what we call the hard top here. Um, that, those tracks actually go right under there, and they show up on the other side, and they keep going. And this is one of the tracks that's the third longest in the world. This is part of the track. It just keeps going and going and going and going. But when you walk along, you, there are all other kinds of tracks. There's like four or five different types of dinosaurs here. It's, it's just like the sauropod, big circular sauropods, acronosaurus. I'll show you in a moment. Uh, so then you've got to do something to get it out of there. So you, 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 you solidified some wood in it with some uh, plaster of Paris. Plaster. Uh, and then you cover it up. And uh, then we, you see that we've got to get it out. So we take off the top. See, we're taking out the latex. You have to go a little bit at a time so it doesn't break. Because that's, that's your mold. Yes, the mold is going to be the rubber. So we just take it out really, really carefully a bit at a time. And then it comes out looking like this. And that's the mold we're going to build off because it holds the shape of the, uh, every detail of the shape underneath. Great experience, you know, to learn out how it's done. And then you make the cast from that. So we are, it obviously takes several. It's very um, pliable. Okay, there you see, the, uh, you see the prints pretty clearly that were cleaned. Right there, there, there. Okay, so... And uh, this is the cast, looks like this. Hold on, stop. I can't stop. Yeah, I did. Okay, so uh, this is like upside down, right? So the, it's upside down. So when you took that back, now, see, the problem is that's too big for a pickup truck. So we had to cut it in three and then bring it back. But then you put it back together when you're in the lab and you don't see anything. You, you chose a professional. So you get back, it's gone. You don't see any, any break or anything. But it's, it's very cool. Then you got to measure. So you, take, you have a GPS positioning of every single track. You're going to measure the length, the width, the stride. It's all done. It's for publishable. It's all documented scientifically. Okay, so just give you an idea. They have this uh, GPS uh, modeling tool also that you can come, and it, you just walk over it, and it gives you a 3D diagram that you can use, and you can rotate, and you can see things. Very cool. Very advanced. Okay, what is it? 
well, it's, it's probably these. So these things, but it's, these, it's, it's the pterodactyl, but this size. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so it's a, a big pterodactyl uh, with the ability to do like four foot <laughs> spans like this. Um, so there are some big things walking around the Black Siege River. And now, let's, I'm going to go to a quote that's important for the rest of the talk. This is from Lewis Jacobs, Southern Methodist University, former president of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. You can't get more evolutionary or dinosaur than this. Okay, Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. He says this in his book, In the Quest of the American Dinosaur. Co-occurrence of men and dinosaurs. Such an association would dispel an earth with vast antiquity, vast time. The entire history of creation, including the day of rest, could be accommodated in the seven biblical days of the Genesis myth. Evolution would be vanquished. So what's he saying here? If you found evidence of human footprints with dinosaur footprints, it would do two things. It would prove that the Bible was true. It would prove that evolution was wrong. And third, well, it's actually the first one, it would prove the earth is young. Right? He's saying that? Saying he's going to prove three things. If we can find dinosaur and humans together in the same strata, then we're going to prove the earth is young, the Bible is true, and evolution is wrong. All right, because their idea is something like this. <laughs> All these people are following me. Um, <laughs> all these weirdos. Okay, their idea is start up there, and you go through evolution, and dinosaurs are up here. Well, yeah, there, right? And so you got all this, so you shouldn't be walking around at the same time, right? And so they have this imaginary geological column, which isn't true, and this does not represent sort of rocks, it just represents sorts of fossils. And you can go places like the Grand Canyon, where you have the uh, Cambrian, and then you have the Car Carboniferous, and you're missing like a hundred million years. It's missing. It's gone. They're, they're, the two layers are completely on top of each other. Well, the model doesn't work. And it's like that. There's many, many examples of this. So, that's the geological column. And that's what they're saying. Dinosaurs are there, and the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous, and humans are up there after the quaternary. Okay? So, the rock here at uh, Paluxy is... Oh, a French slide. Who was I talking to? I said, you'll see. I did you, right? I said, you'll see a French slide. There's a French slide. I didn't notice. <laughs> so these are the French words. Cretaceous, Jurassic, Trias. Okay. So the rock is here. 140 million, 65 million is here. Okay. It's between 100 to 140 million, the rock at the Palaxi, according to evolutionary standards. Okay. Keep that in mind. Now, do we find things that we shouldn't find with dinosaurs, aside from human footprints? Well, I'm going to go through just a couple. Like this is from the University of Regina. They, uh, so Mauricio Barbie, he says, as we excavated the fossil, I thought that we were looking at a skin impression. Then I noticed a piece came off and I realized this is not ordinary, this is real skin. How could skin organic survive like 65 million years, 70 million years? And he says, for Barbie, and the article is, what color were the dinosaurs? Tests of ancient skin sample will reveal final answer. By the way, I think these were purple. For Barbie, how the skin sample survives since the Cretaceous period is a greater question than the color of the skin. Yes. Cretaceous, 100 million years ago. How did that skin survive? Good question. What's not clear is what happened to this dinosaur and how it died. Well, yes it is. There was a worldwide flood. It got buried in mud not too long ago. There is something special about this fossil. No, many fossils are like this, Barbie. And the area where it was found... And I'm going to find out what it is. Go to Genesis. It'll be much faster. <laughs> so, let's go to September 2022. That's recent. Discovery of dinosaur fossil with skin in southern Alberta excites paleontologists. Well, it's not the first time. We just saw another one from the University of Virginia a few years before. Uh, this is a hydrosaur. It's almost complete. They're still working at getting it out. This is tougher than uh, some, like they're, if you're in Montana, you can get out the fossils. They're, they're like in a sort of sand and you take a screwdriver and a paintbrush and you just go, you, you take your screwdriver and you, you hammer it down a bit and it goes down, down, down. Then when you hear tuck, you've either hit a dinosaur bone or uh, an iron nodule. Here, it's actually in the rock. So here you have to like very carefully remove like granites and stuff. It's, it's much more complicated. Uh, still, it's there. And they discovered dinosaur skin on this. Uh, she was the one that found it. She wasn't a paleontologist, Terry. She was just an amateur. I mean, she was just walking around and she discovered. And uh, it was sticking out of the, sticking out of the cliff, right? 
And so you can see the bumps, which is uh, the, the skin. And so as they, got, as they started doing more work, they said, hey, the skin is not fossilized. Um, they said, so far we've moved 100 tons of rock, which we're overburdened to get the fossils. We think the whole skeleton is there, but we don't, won't know for sure until we complete the excavation. And he says, I think the, the specimen was covered quite quickly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Otherwise, it wouldn't be this well preserved. preserved. Exactly. You can see some of its vertebrae and tendons, and once you get closer, you can see some of its scales. The dark, scaly skin has a basketball-like texture. This is something really special. You don't find things like this very often in our field. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's not quite true, and I'll show you why. This is, these are uh, red, um, uh, red blood cells, and this is in a knee of a T-Rex. This is Mary Schweitzer, who really popularized a situation that is uh, well known in uh, 2005. Basically, some science happens just a lot of ha science happens happens by happenstance. Stance. And so, what happened was she had this big femur of a P. Rex, and she wanted to send it to the lab. It was too heavy to send it, so she cut it in half. But when she cut it in half, all of a sudden she had all this stuff that wasn't fossilized. Now it's not like it was bleeding. Okay, <laughs> it's not that young, but it was it wasn't fossilized and it had collagen and she 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 actually pulled the collagen like 17 times apparently and it just it was still elastic. So she says this, it looked exactly like actual bone, but I couldn't believe it. Oh, great. Scientist says she can't believe it. What she's seeing. We have a bit of a problem here, don't we? And the scientist says, I can't believe what I'm seeing. Wait a second, you're not supposed to believe anything. You're just supposed to see it, report it, and then make up your ideas of how it got there. Not come to the table saying, this is what it should be. But that's real science. That's normal science, actually. I said to the laboratory technician, after all, these bones are 65 million years old. How could blood cells survive so long? Great question. Or collagen, right? She got flack, big time. She got big flack. So, uh, she doesn't give up, and she continued her research with Jack Horner, and she found some more, 2009. Four years later, she published on uh, looking at the hadrosaurs, and she found that they contained enough protein of osteocalcin, which is a bone protein, to create a biological reaction. They were really working on bo um, bones more than anything else, because it's hard to say you're, you've got contamination in a bone, right? turkey dies beside your, beside your dinosaur, you know, it's not the same type of bone, so things don't migrate out of bones. So if you're looking at something in a bone, you can say, okay, it didn't migrate from outside to get in there. So I'm, I'm looking at the real thing. So it contains enough protein, to, so it has a biological reaction. And you see, this is a result of a research done where we, we looked over, or Brian Thomas looked over uh, a period of time to see what kind of evidence is there that other people found soft tissue in the past. And it's amazing. These are the supposed millions of years. And you have the Montana T-Rex, which we just talked about, and the Montana Hadrosaur, those are Louis Schweitzer. Then you have the Belgian Mosasaur, 65 million. Then you get things like China, and I can't pronounce it, the Fungosaurus. Uh, it's supposed to be 180 million years old. It has collagen that's non-fossilized. But the collagen, we know, cannot survive more than 10,000 years. We know that. So... What does that mean? Something's, it's not the collagen that's the problem. That's the problem, clearly. Now, Mark Armitage, uh, he actually worked under Mary Schweitzer. He's a Christian. He ran a, laboratory, ran a big laboratory, like a $10 million laboratory in the University of Caltech. And um, he it was a great photographer. And he took a, a T-Rex uh, triceratops horn and uh, got rid of the calcium and he started taking pictures, what you see here. Now, had you been closer to where I live, I would have brought some, because I have cells, I have the microscope, well, here's my, I have my microscope, and I have the plates that Mark Armitage sent me, so you could actually look and see the non-fossilized dinosaur bone cells. But I can't, because I, besides, I came on the seaplane, they wouldn't, <laughs> I had a bag that weighed 50 pounds, so it wouldn't come on the plane, so uh, Dave had to bring it over on the ferry. <laughs> but it got here. Uh, three osteocytes with fin, philip, philopod processes that you see here, very fine processes, and you can see the, the, the uh, great augmentation, so hollow blood, blood vessels, and he has other stuff. So, now he published, and think of this, he published in American Laboratory, that's his picture, on the cover of the magazine, and that magazine dates from, uh, what did it say, December 2000, 
12. Now, when you publish in science, even if you don't get on the cover, that's big news. You want, it's publish or perish, we say. They don't really care if you teach well by university because that doesn't really bring in money. What brings in money is publishing. It's publish, publish, publish. And so he manages to publish on the American Laboratory, uh, which is great pictures. He's obviously a, a master of this. And amazingly enough, he, published, he gets another paper published a month later in Acta Histochemica, which is like the top of their field. And it says here, un, unfossil, well, I translate this, <laughs> soft sheets of fibrillar bone from a fossil of superorbital horn of a dinosaur, which is basically unfossilized bone cells and a triceratops horn. But you've got to make it sound a little bit Latin. Um, so, <laughs> so anyway, that's the, it's the article. You can see his name there, Mark Artich. So another way you could have named this article is this way. A method by which to quickly use, lose your job and career at Cal State University. Because within three weeks, he was fired. Um, despite having published two papers in two months. Why? Well, because it sort of seemed to show that Genesis was right. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually, he, it took three years. I, when I talked to him, he was uh, in his, working out of his basement, fixing microscopes. It took him three years. He did win in court. They had to pay him some six-figure number. We, we don't know what it is, but it was enough to get him back on his feet. But he still lost his lab and lost his reputation. Um, and uh, all that was for one. And the reason he won was because it was clearly religious discrimination. Clearly. Which is illegal in the U.S. It's, it's, it's legal in Canada, by the way. It's not legal in the U.S. So we don't have the same type of protection. Uh, so anyway, it can be dangerous finding soft tennis, dinosaur tissue. So dinosaurs leave prints, like you see here. And so you have prints that are... Uh, and this here is in the news, what, a uh, month or so ago. Dinosaur track, because we had the drought. Well, you're still in a drought. We don't have this. But the drought in the Texas meant that... And this is the Paluxy River. Like, this is right just up the river from where I was. The more tracks. And these are in the river. Like, the river's dried out, so you start seeing these tracks. And so, there we go. So, human tracks. So what's interesting is all along the Paluxy River here... You've got all kinds of human tracks that have been found, fossilized. And we're going to take a look at just a couple of them, because I don't have time. Normally, I, I bring a whole table, and we have like all the tracks out, and we can take a look at them. You can even put your feet in them, see what size the human feet are and stuff. But we'll just take a look at two of them, two tracks, two series of tracks. So first of all, in this case, there was water. So they had to block up the river to free up the tracks that are right there in front. And I'll start showing you this closer. This is a Taylor track. Um, which has, and they'll, they'll clean it up a bit, but you'll see there's the three tracks, but then there's this track in the bottom that is actually a human track. And so, first of all, the big track is an Acrocanthosaurus, okay, there are these creatures, high spiked lizard, and um, here are some of the Taylor tracks. So you can see when you first get to it, it's like you have to know what you're looking for a bit. Um, then you start figuring out, oh, yeah, I start seeing it. And they have this uh, staining that is natural staining because of the chemicals in the mud. So it usually goes to a red, and it can actually deteriorate quite a bit. But if you see this, you see the toes on there? See if you see, I can't reach up high enough. But this is the footprint. This is the dinosaur footprint. We'll look at it closer, okay? But this is the dinosaur footprint, three toes, and then you, without the mud removed. But here you have clearly a human footprint with the, with the toes. No dinosaur is like that, okay? And we have other ones that come out even more clearly. This is when it dried up. You see here the footprint comes out, it actually came out a different color. So you have the toes. And this is the dinosaur footprint. Probably the dinosaur is a lot bigger than the human. Now, why would that happen? Well, because when you're in mud, they're both walking on mud plains. Mud's slippery. You're sinking. It's like walking in snow. So you're going to walk in what has already flattened it out to give you a little support. So they're actually walking in dinosaur tracks because it's easier to walk across the mud plain. Okay, so in the, dinosaur, in the Taylor track, there's a whole bunch of tracks that are along here that are human tracks. And then there are dinosaur tracks. You can see the uh, N N8, etc. Those are dinosaur tracks. They're going in different directions. And you have the human tracks. And they're going in the dinosaur tracks, and eventually they come out of the dinosaur tracks. So let me show you. I'll just show you a representation that's closer. So they're all numbered based on a one a T. So the Taylor track, that's what TT stands for, Taylor track. There's a plus one, minus one. So it's, like in the, it's sort of in the center. Uh, I know you can't read it here, but the minus one is actually this one. Okay, so there are numbers that go minus and numbers that go plus to identify them. Uh, so it's sort of, you'd have to read it from um, here. So, uh, no, minus, minus 3. The minus 3B, a minus 4 is there. So it goes up. So what happens is the track goes like this. 
You're walking, it's left, right, has the five toes, has a ball go bum, 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 bum. Now the evolutionists know that that's there, and their explanation is that the dinosaur had a dislocated heel. Well, it was pretty dislocated because by the fifth step, it's up in its toe. And then by the last one, it's actually changed dinosaurs. That's a pretty badly dislocated heel. So, so here's uh, some evidence I'll just show you. So, so take a look at that. This is a Taylor minus, uh, plus six. And now I'm going to put the... Let's see if it works. There we go. So here I've, I've drawn out. And here's the one at the top that had the, where the foot came out of the dinosaur because uh, he was in these tracks. Now he's in the one going this way. Right? So he went from there to there. And now his heel is like outside of his foot into another dinosaur, if it was the heel. But it isn't, of course. It's a human footprint. And those are the di two different dinosaurs going in two different directions. Okay. So... Uh, so we have all these tracks going, going through. Um, the Taylor track is a beautiful track. I'm, I'm obviously not taking much time because we don't have much time, but just, taking, just showing you a, a, a bit of overview. There's, there's like, uh, I want to specifically show you tracks that were where the human and footprint were together. There are were human and dinosaur together. There are other tracks where there's just human tracks, like series, but they're in the Cretaceous. They're, they're in the same layer, the, the Palexi River. They're in the same layer as the dinosaur layer. It's just they're not walking in it. But they're there. They've been cut. I didn't show all this because I don't think we have time, but, and I want to take questions. But uh, they were, we, there was like the, um, the Burdick track um, or the Clark track also. They, what we did is, if there was going to be a carving, say someone wanted to fraud this, and, and there was a, one carving made back in the 30s. Uh, but uh, not even sure it was made in situ, actually. But the, uh, so how do you check that? You cut it in half. Do I have that? Hold on a second, I made. Yeah, I do. Okay, I'll show you how they do it. Um, and then they run it through a C-scan. So, uh, so that we're going to look at the Delk track here. So we just went through the uh, Taylor track. Up, up here, uh, let me see, if you go up, there's, another, there's human tracks even in the, um, uh, the state park. And I'll show you a sign they put up to explain the human tracks in the state park. <laughs> it's sort of funny. Uh, you can see the Taylor tracks, the 14 tracks, human tracks, it says there, uh, right in here. Okay, so actually we were working right near there. Uh, so this is a Delk track we saw further up. So this one is a single track. Uh, it was taken out in the 50s. Now this one was actually removed, whereas right now the Taylor track is still there. We didn't remove anything, just made molds. But this one was removed. So in the Creation Evidence Museum, they have the original, not the cast. They have the original right there. And Stephen Ga Dawkins and... Uh, no. Richard Dawkins and Stephen Gould both came to the Creation Museum with a professor from the University of Texas before it was the big building we saw. And when they came, because when I was down there, Carl Ball was explaining the story. Carl Ball was off, Dr. Ball was off doing a TV program, and there was a 17-year-old boy who was responsible for taking care of the museum. Well, you know, homeschooler Christians come and visit, and they're really nice and everything. And then he gets this guy, <laughs> this guy who's from Oxford and Harvard. <laughs> and they, they say, we're from Oxford. Well, no, they say it in British. I don't I can't do accents. British accent, you know. We're from Harvard. Uh, he's from Harvard, and I'm from Oxford, and you've got to open this museum. And he says, Guys, okay, but he's not, he's not impressed, right? Because he doesn't, he's not into the university scene. And so he says, no problem, come on in, I'll show you around. So he shows him around, he shows him the Delk track. He said, that's Cretaceous rock? He said, that can't be Cretaceous rock. And his dad said, yeah, that's Cretaceous rock. And then uh, Dawkins said, that can't be Cretaceous rock. But the professor at University of Texas says, I don't understand it, but that is Cretaceous rock, and that's rock from here. Okay. So they go on and they see some other ones that I'm going to show in a second, some other ar artifacts. And oh, oh, and he replied, that's impossible. Then they go further on and they see some other stuff that I'm going to show you. And, they, and it was always, that's impossible. And then they left. They've seen the evidence and yet denied it. Wrote books against God. Wrote books against... Because if you see a human footprint and a dinosaur footprint, it does three things. It means the earth is... Young, the Bible is true and evolution is wrong or false. But it's there. They knew it. They saw the evidence. So uh, you can keep doing studies on it. So they cut across the, they did several cuts. Um, when I say cuts, they didn't cut the fossil, obviously. They used C scans. So I did, they did do, earlier on, like in the 80s, they actually did take a fossil, a human footprint, that wasn't in the dinosaur one, uh, the Burdick one, and they cut it. And I actually saw a presentation with eight scientists in 1986 
where they were showing exactly this. What they wanted to see was, is there evidence of compression in the mud? Right? So, if, so if you walk in mud, you're going to compress the mud, and then it'll be more dense. So in a C-scan, what's more dense shows up as darker. Okay? And then you have lighter. And that's exactly what you see. You see around the place where the... Because you couldn't do that if you were like sculpting something. You couldn't create density below what you're sculpting. So that's exactly what you see. You see the black parts around where the compression is, and so it does look to be like a true tag. It wasn't, um, but it's clearly human and, and, and fossil. And so uh, they have other ones that you can see here. They're just the human tracks. Um, they're not always that clear, but this one's pretty clear. Pretty big human tracks, by the way. However, the ones we have, even the biggest one we have, uh, doesn't go beyond what Shaq O'Neal would put on. Okay, which is like a size 16 or 17. Okay, so the, the, the park, what does the park have? The park has this as a sign. This should show, slow them down a bit, and they got the dinosaur with like human. <laughs> okay. Ah, what's this? And if you put your hand in it, it fits exactly your hand. Well, not all hands, but... A, uh, a medium-sized hand. Mine's a bit bigger than that. Actually, the other footprints, there's one of them. The one in the Taylor track is a size 9, woman, size 9. And we actually had a, that when I gave my last talk in my church, there was a lady there, uh, we asked, is there anybody here with a 9? She said, yes. She came up, she put her foot, her barefoot in it, and it was exact. It was exactly a print. And it has everything. It has the ball, the, everything. It's right there. And we have a finger. Now, I'm not sure, I'm not 100% convinced that this is the real finger. I think this may be like, uh, the, like my dinosaur tracks in England, where it's, there was a finger, but it got filled in, and then we're looking at the mud. I'm not, Carl Ball thinks it's the real finger. I'm not 100% convinced. But anyway, it's a, clearly a finger. This is an artifact. Uh, so all these kind of things are found there. They even find, I didn't put them in, but they even find uh, uh, cat tracks. But cat, I mean, this big. This is like big, big cat. And of course, we do know before the flood, many things were big, bigger. Even shortly after the flood, many things were bigger. Two uh, uh, beavers that were two meters high. You know, moose that have, they're like three and a half meters from point to point at the end. You know, it's not something you're going to put on the front of your pickup truck after you've killed it. You know, it's like, boom, <laughs> you're not going to go anywhere. So things were bigger. People were probably bigger, and which would make sense. So I've just given you just something to give you a taste. Uh, there's much more information. Actually, if I was to point you to something, if you want to see more, I would suggest going to YouTube to Wazulu. So it's W-A-Z-O-O-L-O-O. -O -O -O. That's Ian Juby's channel. In, in, and she, he has a program called Genesis Week that he does weekly, a, a program on the Miracle Channel. And um, he has three programs. I think it's 30, this uh, program like from last year, 30, th or this spring, 33 to 36, I think. So you can go on YouTube and look them down. You'll see it'll be marked Dinosaur Footprints. He did, the, he did research himself on the Taylor Track. Like, a, I, I was there doing working on the pterosaur, but he did the tailor track. So he has some really interesting things to say, and he goes through it really in detail. So if you want to see, see more, yes? Yeah, Wazulu, W-A-Z-O-O-L-O-O. -O -O -O. So if you go onto YouTube, you type Wazulu, it'll come up with Ian Juby's uh, channel, and then you can see all his, I think he has like 40 sets about all kinds of things about creation. It's a great series. They're, they're like half-hour sets, like 25-minute sets because that's what the program is. But he does three programs on the tracks, and they're, they're just whew, they're fantastic. And I, had him, I had him come to my church this fall, like at the uh, end of August, for the help, they call it equipping the students, right? And uh, so he came, and he, he, has more, he has way more tracks than I, or casts than I do, because he makes casts, like himself. So he had, <laughs> we just, we filled the church with fossils cast we had dinosaur heads he has a life-size t-rex head up here we call him al al the allosaurus and he has a hadrosaurus head i think no al it must be a, like a one tenth or one fifth but the hadrosaur head is massive i mean it's like the three chairs long it's crazy and uh he we had all that up on stage with some palm trees and stuff it was a different sunday <laughs> all right final slide charles templeton charles templeton was the Billy, he, he, he knew Billy Graham. They were friends. He was a Billy Graham. He brought many, many thousands of people to the Lord. Okay? He left the faith mainly because he couldn't cope with the Old Testament. He couldn't cope with the, what the Israelites did with the Canaanites, being killing everybody at all levels. And he couldn't cope with evolution, with Genesis. 
and he was pretty open about that. And he had a discussion with with um, Billy Graham, and uh, Billy Graham understood his position, but said, "No, I've chosen to walk by faith, and whether I understand the whole Bible doesn't matter. I know what's true." He chose to walk that. Templeton decided not to, and and he was interviewed actually by. Um, uh, Lee Strobel, who has that famous Case for Christ. We have that video, Case for Christ, Case for Creation. There's a third one, Case for Something. Um, and so he was interviewed by him. Uh, and at one point, in the middle of the interview, Charles Templeton says, I miss Jesus. And it was like something happened. For a moment in time, there was like a tear came to my eye, and it was like a moment in time, and then all of a sudden it passed. And he was back to being the Charles Templeton, who's totally anti-God. Bizarre. Um, and again, I'm going to quote Romans 1, 21, 23. Um, his, his book, by the way, is called Farewell to God, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. And again, we've got this situation where professing themselves to be wise, they become fools and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man to birds, to four-footed beasts, and to creeping things. And yet the evidence is there. If you have humans and dinosaurs in the same layer, you've just shown that the earth is young, the Bible is true, and evolution is false. Thank you. So, do you want me to take some questions? What do you want to do? Does anybody have questions? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, he has his hand was up immediately. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, carbon dating has nothing to do with uh, the long ages of evolution because you can only have carbon datable for about 50,000 years, which is nothing from an evolutionary. By the way, I've carbon dated dinosaur bones along with Vance Nelson, and we got them car carbon dated at the University of Georgia. They're not supposed to have carbon because the carbon has all disappeared. Carbon-14 will have all disappeared. They do have carbon, significant amount of carbon. Uh, and they all have the same amount, which fits perfectly in a flood model. So, but normally, outside of what Vance Nelson and myself have done, uh, normally what we're talking about is someone who doesn't know what they're talking about, like a journalist who mentions carbon dating along with dinosaurs, because evolutionists won't talk about that. They'll talk about mineral dating, which would be potassium argon or uranium lead or some strobium rubidium or different models, uh, ways of doing it. And um, they cannot, and it's very important to understand this, you cannot date, except for carbon, you cannot date a fossil because it's sedimentary rock. And sediment is like mud in Bonner Lake, okay? So it's a mix of rock. So when you're dating, you could have rock, you know, your mix would have rock that's different ages. So how would you, every time you date, you get a different age depending on what you fell on in the sediment. So no one's dating the fossil. That's important. They're taking like lava and saying this, or they're looking at index fossils. That fo oh, that's, a, that's an index fossil for the Jurassic. Must be a Jurassic. And in fact, when you do carbon dating, I have the letter uh, in my Age of the Earth talk. I have, I have a letter for a, a, a lab, and they ask you, what age do you think it is? And for a sum of money, they'll give you the age you thought it was. <laughs> yes. So, uh, in in the present environment, it can't. It doesn't. It doesn't get destroyed. It, it It means that matter and energy are interchangeable. So there you have an equilibrium of, of uh, stuff okay, for the universe. But the matter has to have a, a beginning. Because matter doesn't exist eternally. The problem is... Yeah, but the problem is the second law. So you have, that's the first law of thermodynamics. But the second law of thermodynamics says basically that everything's going towards disorder from a physical and chemical point of view. And in fact, it is in our bodies. The whole point of enzymes, everybody hears about enzymes. Enzymes have one role to try to counteract the second law of thermodynamic and, so, and um, make reactions possible losing less energy. So basically thermodynamics, because a lot of people don't know what we're talking about, thermo is heat, dynamics is movement of heat. So whenever you have a reaction, you lose heat. Like when you're eating, you get hot, right? You, you, your body, has, when you stop eating, you get cold. Okay, it's because the energy isn't there to react, but all that heat you're feeling, or your car's making, whatever, is lost to the universe. It's not usable anymore, okay? So you have to keep eating. So. Why? Well, things are breaking down. Okay, so the problem is, uh, if matter breaks down, then it's going in one direction. 
They'll call it the deep freeze or whatever. Okay, you go in one direction. So it isn't in equilibrium as it is today. It's going in a direction. That direction insists that you have to have a beginning because it has to be hot. Go towards cold. It can't be cold and go towards hot. So they, 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 they know there are lots of issues here. The issue isn't with the law of thermodynamics, which a Christian created, Isaac Newton. Well, then that's fine. The issue is, what, how do you explain that without God? All, the, all these problems disappear as soon as you have a creator. It makes life a lot easier. <laughs> yes? Sure. Actually, the best people to talk to would be uh, like Rob here and Dave, uh, because it depends on the age group, right? But they have all that at the table. So I would suggest just talking to them because there's all different uh, uh, types. Of course, my talks are the best, and so you can... <laughs> What's this? No, no, I have the USB key. <laughs> and those $5 DVDs out there, those are actually really good. So, <laughs> spilled a $25, like as much as you'd spend on a McDonald's dinner. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, another question? Yes, sir. I didn't understand uh, the comparison you made. They say creation things are Sure. Um, so everything behind evolution, all the information behind evolution comes from the genetic code, right? We're just an expression of our genetic codes. For a geneticist, you're nothing but walking genetic codes. Uh, and you're expressed based on your environment and what's already pre-coded on how it handles the energy and matter that's around you. Okay. So that being the case, um, if you're going to incre- if you're going to improve, in quotation marks, if you're going to improve, uh, it's going to take energy to do that. It's going to take a lot of energy to change. You don't just change like we're not spontaneously changing. Evolution would like that. You'd think after a billion years this would be what was happening, but that's not what's happening. We're extremely stable. So to get the change is going to be very costly. And on top of that, you have to have it go through your whole population. Very difficult to do, except under extreme circumstances. And so evolution has a hard time getting anywhere. So to get just a bit better... It's, it's a heavy, heavy pay. It's a heavy cost. You have to get rid of everybody else in your population to get better. And so you're not going to go produce something that's not useful. Everything, every step has to be useful for evolution. Otherwise, it's going to be limited. Why would you keep something that's not useful? Or why would you keep something that's going to be useful in the future, but it's not useful yet? A fly doesn't have, let's say it doesn't have wings. How are you going to put wings on it? Because a, a fly with 2% of a wing, you're going to get rid of that. Know what I mean? You're not, you're not going to use it. So, so you're never going to get over design. You're never going to get these things like a caterpillar and a butterfly in the same organism. You're not going to get woodpeckers that start their tongue here. You're going to make a signal because there are other birds that get insects much easier than that. Why would you have this, this thing that does it completely the most complex way even imaginable? Well, because it wasn't evolved. It would, it, you can't devise a scenario by which you could arrive at over design and evolution. Hope that understands. Yes, sir. Uh, should we reject evolution as a whole, or are there certain parts of evolution that we should accept? Okay, what do you think? Well, I think uh, natural selection is probably explained a tiny bit, like modern animals and like. Right, so, yeah, we are in agreement in, I wouldn't call it natural selection, I call it adaptation. So, natural, the thing is, evolution wants you to be better through natural selection. But that's not what happens. In natural selection, if I was giving you a quick, uh, easy analogy, let's pretend half the, we'll divide the room in half. So you're a population that survives well in your environment. It, this side, let's say this side here, they have uh, the intelligence, and this side here, you have the strength. You have some intelligence, they have some strength, but you understand you have advantages in both sides. That's a typical population. You have a variety, that's why you survive. If you don't have any variety, you're in big trouble when something comes through, it's gone. So you, you survive, you have these variations. Perfect. A 24-hour flu comes in really fast. You're dead in 24 hours. Who's going to be selected in your environment? The strong or the intelligent? The intelligent, sorry. Dave. <laughs> I had to get rid of something. So you've just selected. That's natural selection. You've survived, but you're not more advanced, are you? You've lost the advantage that the rest of the population was giving you in terms of intelligence. So natural selection actually never it progresses you. You can survive, but you're actually devolving. That's why I would say we agree in adaptation. There are adaptations that occur, 
But if you notice that 90% of the, everything that was probably on the ark has already been gone extinct because of the fact that climate has changed, all kinds of things. They didn't have the capacity to adapt far enough. And we certainly don't see any evidence of advancing in, through a process of natural selection. So I wouldn't include natural selection. There is, that, like I just said, that's an example of natural selection, but it's not something that would help evolution. It does fit a creation model, because if you're going to have things get worse over time, we get more and more mutations over time, you understand everything's going worse genetically and biologically, then you have to start with something perfect to begin with. And that fits. When you were reading the verses this morning, everything was good. Perfect. Yes? Yeah, but I don't agree. I, I thought about that, but I don't agree with macroevolution because I don't think there's any evolution. So, true, but we can't... Even the, the different kinds of dogs and cats is only what we call... Uh, is only adaptation. There's artificial selection. And actually, almost all dogs we have now uh, are, can be traced back to 200 years. Okay, it's not long for all, almost all the types of dogs we have now. And that's artificial. Human did it. It's not like a natural selection, like a wolf changing into a fox. Uh, so there is, uh, I was talking about that last night, about some of the uh, different processes around speciation since the flood. So you have like three or four different ways, and different organisms use different ways of, of getting, well, God programmed it in our ability. One, one example is really important. This is a, something I say that you gotta, we got to remember. It's inside out. If you don't have it inside, you're not going to have it outside. So what happens is, a, a picture I show, there's a professor, I'm trying to remember his name, Laxki or something. He was in, in Florida. He had a house, and he built the house to withstand like 250 kilometer hour winds. A, a hurricane went through, and they have pictures of this. All the houses were flattened, except his house. He's like, every single house is flattened all around. His house is up. Well, it's not because the house adapted. You understand what I mean? It had to have the information before the hurricane came to be able to adapt or change the hurricane. So, I, so that's why I, I, I don't, I've stopped using the idea of we're, we agree on microevolution. We don't agree on any evolution. We agree on adaptation, good programming, and devolution. And I, not D-E-V-I-L, but devolving, <laughs> devolution. Of course, if you're in England, they call evolution evolution. <laughs> Which, I always say yes. <laughs> okay, final, final couple questions, and then we'll wrap up by 30. Anybody? Uh, yes? You said something about the footprint being a female side nine. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. We don't know the gender. We just knew it fit a, f uh, we just knew fit a woman's nine. <laughs> we don't, I'm not sure you could have men that have the same type of feet. I, I don't know. There may be some. What, what, I know. I don't know. I don't know. We just we just knew it would fit. So when we asked someone in the room if they have a nine, and she happened to have, she happened to have painted yellow toenails. So when she took off her shoe, it was great for the photo op, yo. <laughs> you could see really the five toes are really clear. <laughs> All right. Yes. Well, actually, evolution. the evolutionists spoke about that. I just repeated it. Okay. So <laughs> um, I'm just touching base on the second one. So the Bible is true. Yes. But I was just wondering, like, how does the existence of dinosaurs prove the Bible is true? No, dinosaurs and human together. Dinosaurs and human together. That the point is for him that in the, the remember he mentions the six the six days. He mentions the six days the, of the creation myth. Because he knows in the six days, on day six, you get dinosaurs, reptiles, and humans. Mm -hmm. So we're living together. Okay. That's what he meant. All right. So it's like, because that was like disproving the timing of other scientists, that's proof of the Bible. Proof. No, it's because it corresponds exactly to what's written in the first chapter of Genesis. Okay. That's why it proves the Bible true. Because you've got something written there that's a historic text. And then you look and you find the evidence for it. Humans and dinosaurs. Make sense? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right then. All right. We're good. Well, I'm okay. <laughs> God bless. Thank you.